Jesus glad and the devil mad. Amen. Let's rejoice. Well, why don't we lift our Bibles and uh, let our and, and just let our joy come forth and uh, let's say, say, send a signal to the Lord that we're joyful and uh, let's make the devil mad at the same time. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God for this word. Thank God for this word. My life is built not on shifting sand, but it's built on the word of God. And thank God for Rhema, the revealed word of God, the God breathed word, because it's through the Rhema of God that my faith is built and that my spirit is developed. And so tonight, Holy Spirit, I'm seeking your stability in my life through your word. So breathe upon it and let it become real to me. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, we'll read a few verses here. Paul is writing to his son in the faith in 2 Timothy because it relates to uh, the end times. We call it an end time book. A second Peter, Jude, uh, end time book, James, end time book. And so we certainly are in the end times. Amen. We have the signs of his return all around us. Second Timothy chapter three, verse one. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of good, or lovers of God, rather. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sin, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do also these resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Verse 9, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax or increase worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Last day's dangers. Paul warning his son in the faith of what was going to occur. And since uh, Paul later says it's about time for me to be offered, uh, he wanted to prepare him in case some of these things were going to come to pass after he went to heaven. And he wanted to leave a legacy of what to do when they found themselves in the last of the last days and these prophetic uh, words start coming to pass, which we, what we've read is a, is a, a word of wisdom. It's a, it's a prophetic utterance, a future event uh, sent to warn the church and sent to warn us today because we are living even closer uh, to when these events occur. And I, and I, I suspect that we can all bear witness that we're seeing uh, many of these right now, the uh, high-minded, the, the heady, high-minded, being, being uh, traitorous, uh, uh, having a form of godliness, deny the power thereof. You know, some of these people are shameless to speak out uh, pontificating and religious-sounding words as if they're so uh, uh, virtuous. They, they love to virtue signal how, uh, how pure they are when really they're, they're like these sepulchers that uh, Jesus talked about, full of dead men's bones. <laughs> and we can see that going on right now. So um, 
they're, they're, they're dangerous times. Perilous means dangerous. It can mean dangerous in, in a number of ways. It could be dangerous, to, yes, because these people have power and they can, they can act, act with power and, and, and take your life from you. There's a lot of people that have, that have uh, over this arbitrary uh, action of uh, lockdowns, trying to escape a, a virus, a pandemic, uh, we've heard every excuse. It started out, let's flatten the curve, and then it quickly went from there to let's, uh, let's not get it, let's prevent getting it. Well, no one can prevent getting it. It's a virus, it's in the air. It's, it's, it's not a matter of if you're gonna get it, it's when. And at first, yeah, they didn't know how the hospitals would would uh, react, but it, all that panic about not having enough po hospital space, if we'll just look back to last April and May, we never ran out of hospital space. But we wrecked the hospital system and we, we misappropriated the medical staff uh, to treat patients that were not as, as bad as they said they were. And then it became something about, well, we've got to avoid deaths. And, and so we've got one thing to the next thing, it's just like a bunch of grasshoppers, they move the goalposts Nothing scientific about it. At first, at first, the first month and a half, we weren't supposed to wear masks. And all of a sudden, now he's the same guy, Fauci, is talking about wearing double masks. <laughs> oh, boy. So, uh, it's dangerous. People like that can kill you, not from the pandemic, but from uh, the unintended consequences of not having the right medical uh, available to people in emergencies. I mean, suicides are up, uh, su uh, you know, divorces are up, uh, domestic violence is up, almost all crime is up. Why? Because people are hopeless. People are shut in uh, for no good reason and it's having a terrible effect on society. Students are not able to learn properly. This in-house learning, like the, what they're doing is all experimental. And we're, got, we're not going to know for a long time that it failed, but I, I have an idea that we're going to find out that these kids failed to learn very much with uh, trying to learn at home with this, uh, this uh, in-house learning. So uh, dangerous, yes, they're dangerous on the outside, dangerous on the inside because, because when you're cut off from the truth, uh, that's always dangerous for your spiritual health, your mental health. Uh, we need each other. Human beings need personal contact. And so the other aspect of dangerous means hard to bear and difficult to take. And that's, that's shown in the Amplified Bible when you read these verses in the Amplified. And so it's certainly that. It's, we're living in days that are just, they're hard to take daily, every day. When you hear all these executive orders being signed. He's trying to totally one-man show just with an executive order trying to destroy the oil and gas business. I mean, he signed some things today that if, they, if it goes through and it's enforced, I mean, Texas is going to have a real challenge because Ch Texas is one of the great leading oil and gas states. They have all these uh, ridiculous uh, ideas that we're going to suddenly go on wind power, offshore wind power. Well, we don't have anything offshore right now. How, when is that going to be? He has these arbitrary dates. They have nothing scientific. These are just edicts. These are just people that are drunk on power uh, saying things. Oh, pastor, this is sounding terrible. No, I'm, I'm here to, to you know, all this is written in the Bible for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age have come, 1 Corinthians 10 says. So listen, we're anointed to face these things and to overcome them. I want to keep you encouraged along those lines. So. Uh, we live in the compression of the ages. I mentioned that a couple of times. Charles Capps coined that phrase uh, years ago. And it, it, it's like an hourglass. You know, the sand starts to move at the top of the hourglass. You can hardly see it move. But as it goes down, 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 gets toward the neck, you can actually see the level of the sand move. And as it goes through the neck, it accelerates and goes and drops down into the bottom. And then, boom, that hour is over. And so time seems to be accelerating. And we live in that neck. We live in that compression where the pressure is on. So <clears throat> let's not be hopeless, but let's grab a hold of the Word of God and, and receive encouragement from it. 
because God chose you and I to live right now. We could have lived any other time, but he, he chose us to live now, and so he's got a special grace that we can tap into if we just will. Uh, so the first Sunday, I, I gave you some, some ways to stay protected from last day's dangers, and we drew those out of uh, various verses in um, chapters 3 and 4. So, for instance, in chapter uh, 3, verse 10, the first one that I gave you was carefully follow the lives of your leaders. Uh, see, uh, he was challenging, uh, he was challenging uh, uh, Timothy. He said, just don't remember what you've learned and who you learned them from. You know, just continue. Be, be, you know, you've fully known my, my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith. My uh, long suffering, my agape, my patience, you fully know that. And that's why church online is not church because you can't know somebody on YouTube. You don't know somebody that's preaching at a great distance. I know some of you are watching me and that's great. But you need a local church if at all possible. Find a local church to be part of. We can fill a void for a season, but at some point in time, you need a pastor that you can see and he can see you or she can see you, one of the two. And then that way, you know, you, it's more of a scriptural basis. He said, remember who you, who you heard. And he said, continue in what you've learned. Continue. Number two, continue. I see people departing. I see people throwing away things that they used to know and just getting rid of it. I, I knew a, a young man one time, and he, he uh, uh, sat under a good ministry, and he was word of faith, as far as I could tell. He started another work in another city, and I knew him, and came back to visit uh, here in Houston for a while, a hometown visit over the holidays. We had time to go out to lunch, and he started trying to recruit me to start following, you know, this particular TV preacher. Uh, and uh, I had heard him, and I had uh, listened to some of uh, his messages, and I had read uh, where uh, men of God, I'm talking about Joseph Prince. I'm, I'm naming names now. I'm naming names because the hour is late and you don't have time to be listening to people that have false ministries. He went to ORU. He seems to have a very good uh, resume, but the man is preaching things that are not in the Bible, and they're injurious. And so here's this young preacher, quite a bit younger than me, not as experienced as me, and he's trying to sell me on the idea and I listened to him, and I said, well, you know, for somebody to come along and say that 1 John is not written to Christians and that we should only look at the epistles written by Paul and tear out of our Bibles 1 and 2 Peter, Jude, James, I said, I could never follow someone like that. And uh, that error has already surfaced. It was around about 25 years ago. I was very familiar with the same lie. Some preachers were around then back in the 80s. 70s they were trying to preach that and it died down now it's revived again here's this guy and of course he's on television everywhere and I know that men of renown tried to sit with him tried to help him so that's one example see see he's telling he's telling uh, Timothy listen you know where I come from I lived my life in front of you you know so continue in what you've heard and uh, you know I like what Jesus said in John 8, 31, 32. He said, uh, you shall, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So it's only if you continue. And that word continue means to hold yourself uh, in constantly to the word. You've got you've to shut yourself in to the word and what you heard, the teaching, the doctrine. And I'm not giving up the word of faith doctrine. It's why I stand before you tonight. It's what got me out of the hospital three years ago. <laughs> knowing who I am in Christ, knowing that my, my, my authority in Jesus is intact. And uh, these, are, these, are, these are doctrines that are not negotiable with me. And uh, I'm not listening to anybody that tells me that uh, I don't have to confess my sins, that that's not necessary. Uh, that looks like the road to disaster. Everyone has to confess. Just ask Lucifer. You know, he didn't confess his sin. He wound up getting kicked out of heaven. All right. 
so continue and then then he said preach the word in season and out well if he was supposed to preach the word then on your side you're supposed to love the word you're supposed to love uh, re reprove re rebuke and exhortation see not everything is a as a participation trophy. Not everybody, everybody gets a gold star every week. I mean, sometimes, I don't know, some of the ways we hear pre preaching nowadays, it's, it's, it's encouraging, all right, but it's never challenging. It's motivating, but it's not disciplined. It's not disciplined enough. You know, you can motivate people all day long, but until you discipline them, until you get them into a, the habit of doing what it takes to win, it reminds me of a, a, of a, a rah-rah coach, you know, of some, of some football team. He's all excited, got the boys all excited about the football game. They go out there and they get slaughtered 50 to nothing. Well, yeah, they were excited, but they weren't disciplined enough to know how to block and to tackle, how to do the basics, <laughs> you know. They need to go back to the, this is a football. <laughs> It's big in the middle and small on the ends. <laughs> you know, you, they need the basics. And sometimes that's what we need. We need the basics over and over until we're adept at putting the basics to work. And, uh, and that's my job. That's the job of a good pastor is to teach you and not to be embarrassed to repeat. You know, the fear of repetition. I don't have any fear of repetition. I've preached this years ago. I'll probably preach it again in a couple of years from now. Whenever God says to preach it again, I'll preach it again because it's necessary. Uh, so, so if you told Timothy to preach the word in season and out, then on our side as members, we need to never get tired of listening and studying the word, even if we've heard it over and over. You know, I was at Lakewood one time, and, I happened, and at the time I was there, I happened to be broke. I think I had, I don't know, less than $100 in the bank, and then it, and at one point during that series that he preached, I got down to $10, $10 in a bank. I still don't know how they kept my bank account up. But during that season, every time I went to church, Brother Osteen was pre preaching on giving. And he did 32 straight messages <laughs> on the truth of giving, tithing and giving, giving offerings over and above. He taught it from every angle. And I mean to tell you that that was a challenge for me because I needed it. I had lived it. I believed everything he was saying. But every time I heard it, I was hearing the devil was condemning me because I was flat broke, you know. And, of course, later on I found out the reason I was flat broke. It wasn't because I wasn't a giver because I was a giver. But there also had another, another part of being prosperous is that you have to learn how to hear from the Holy Ghost. Listen to the Spirit of God when he speaks, and then obey. <laughs> and I had missed a few signals, very important ones. And so, uh, but I'm so glad that he didn't get tired of preaching the truth because I, by the time he finished that series, I was back on my way up again, and I had my turnaround. My breakthrough came. Uh, and then he, uh, so then tonight, we didn't get to get into uh, this one. I th we we might have mentioned it Sunday, but... Uh, in verse 5 of chapter 4, uh, Paul tells, tells Timothy, he says to, uh, uh, to watch in prayer. He says to watch in prayer in all things. Watch in prayer in all things. Verse 5, chapter 4. Watch thou in all things. So watch means to pray. So uh, now's not the time to doze off. We have a powerful part to play. Even when we're seeing things that are out of order, the government that we have is not what, I, I believe a majority of Americans don't want communism or socialism. I, I, I know they don't want it. But this, this administration looks like that they're marching toward it. And uh, what can we do? Well, we, well, number one, we can pray. I heard somebody say, well, we need to pray for President Biden for his success because our success is uh, rooted in his success. Well, I, I, I differ with that 100%. I would never pray for a man like that to have success because that means America goes down. 
No, I'm going to frustrate his plans. I'm going to cry against every executive order that he puts out there because I know they're disastrous. They're job killers. They're, they're wrong-headed. This whole global warming thing is nothing but worshiping the creation, uh, putting government as God. It's not scientific. Global warming has not. Man-made global warming is a lie. It's concocted by left-wing people to take your money and turn you into a third world country that they can control. And so there it is. And I've, I've been educated in the sciences. I'm an, I have an engineer, an engineering degree. So I feel like that I can look at data. I can look at, at things. And, and their so-called models that they have are totally faulty because they ignore the water vapor and the effect of water vapor has in the atmosphere. And you cannot do that and ever forecast any kind of weather or temperature rise or temperature fall. So I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not praying for him. I'm praying against him. I'm praying that he fails. I pray that his policies don't work. I pray that people resist. See, let's, let's get our, whatever religious hat somebody tries to put on you, let's stick with what, what the word says to do. And uh, would you pray for the devil when he gets up in the morning? And yet these people are demonic. They are, they are doing the devil's work. So no, they, he was not duly elected. It was, you know, there's lots of questions. Lots of questions. They had questions all the way through for four years of Donald Trump. And just because a few people have raised some pro questions, all of a sudden they don't want to talk about it. So let's pray. Let's pray and resist. Uh, watch in prayer in all things. It's a critical, critical moment right now. Praise God. So we're praying here at Glorious Way. We'll have, we've suspended prayer for tomorrow night because we want everyone involved in our Word and Spirit Conference. That's going to be Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning, sa Sunday night. So five powerful services with, with the Hankins, Mark and Trina are coming. And they're bringing a, a wonderful impartation so I wanted everybody to be fresh for that. And so for this, this week, we're going to suspend, suspend prayer Thursday night. But you can still pray at home for your nation. So he's talking about how to stay protected from the last day's dangers. Be a person of prayer. And then in verse 5, chapter 4, it says, endure afflictions. Endure afflictions. Really, the word endure would be better worded overcome. You know, when you see the word endure, it looks like, well, you just got your head bowed, you're just uh, trudging along, and you're just having to put, it up, put up with uncomfortable situation. No, it really means to overcome afflictions. And what are afflictions? Well, it means hardships, evils, trouble. And on top of that, these kind of things could be increasing. Now, Jesus let us know that, and this is a verification of what Jesus uh, told us in Luke 21 and Mark 24. He said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. And that's exactly the way it is right now. They hated Trump. They hated the Trump voter. Well, think about what Trump really stood for in his campaign. Well, he, he stood for life. He, he, he stood for, for uh, ending abortion. He stood for faith and family getting the churches open back up. And, uh, and his supporters were overwhelmingly Christian. And, uh, and so they hate Trump, they hate Christians. I mean, that's just, it's coming through loud and clear. On, but on the other side, they try to claim to be Christians. I noticed where, where uh, uh, Biden went to church Sunday. Well, whoop de doo I wonder how many years it's been. And so he went to church, the Catholic church. I mean, it's amazing to me. He must be in a diocese that's real liberal because most, 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 most of the time when I was growing up, anybody like that that advocated for the things he advocates for would be excommunicated. And uh, that just shows you how far they've slipped. All our Catholic friends, you might ought to examine why you're still going to the Catholic church with these inconsistencies. But... Um, uh, endure afflictions. You know, we're going to overcome those afflictions. We're not going to try to, uh, to go along to get along. It's the worst thing that you can do is to try to bargain with the devil. Just resist. Just resist and overcome the afflictions that come. 
Now, I was telling you here a few weeks ago, let's develop uh, thick skins and tender hearts. <laughs> I mean, let's not take everything quite so personal. Let's not, let's not dissolve into a ball of tears when people start hurling names at us like hater, you know, and so forth and so on. We, I, I, I heard various news media types saying that anybody that voted for Trump, they need to be deprogrammed. They're starting to sound like the communist Chinese. You know, that's what they did. They, they had a, a, a time when they arrested everybody that differed with them and put them in re-education camps, uh, which is another word for concentration camps, and they didn't come out of there either. I mean, re-education, nobody ever knew what, what, el what else they learned in there. I think they learned how to work themselves to death. And uh, millions of people died for communism to take China. Millions of people died for communism to take Russia. Millions of people died for communism to take over East Germany and, the, and all of the Eastern Bloc nations. I mean, it is no good deal. I mean, our younger folks don't know anything about the evils of communism. I grew up with it, and uh, we had lots of movies about it. I, I, t I know movies are, can be like, you know, untrue and all of that, but Generally speaking, in those days, they, it wasn't propaganda. It was real. It was, a, it was a story of the Cold War, and we fought a Cold War. And it sounds like we're right in the middle of one again. All right, verse 5 again, it says, Do the work of an evangelist. So he's telling Timothy, do the work, you know. Well, what was Timothy? Well, Timothy was an apostle. Well, what is an apostle? Apostle... Uh, in that dispensation is one who started a number of churches. He's got a number of churches that he began, and he's kind of uh, staying in touch with them, making sure that they're strong, making sure that they were doing well. He's not their boss, even though he started the church. Once he delegates that church to a pastor, the pastor becomes the, the leading authority in that church. He is, he is the spiritual head of that church. But uh, having uh, an, uh, an apostle just means that you have someone that has your best interests and someone that's got a lot of experience. And even though he was young, he was able to impart to ministers. So you could call him a father of ministers or a father of, of pastors. And the apostolic is an office. It comes with its own utterance. It comes with its own set of supernatural equipment. You can't call yourself an apostle. You can't volunteer to be one any more than you can volunteer to be a, a pastor or an evangelist. So what does he mean, do the work of an evangelist? Well, the work of an evangelist was uh, really to go around preaching and, and getting souls saved, getting people saved. And that's a special anointing. It also encourages believers to do the same. So do the work of an evangelist. Paul is challenging Timothy, and he's saying, you know, love winning the lost love missions don't give up on your missions program don't give up on winning the lost and so for a minister to uh, win the lost it's more than just one-on-one -on -one. he trains others how and demonstrates to others the church how to win the lost and i've had a lot of uh, evangelism training in my days and both the full gospel businessmen and then another church that i was head of the uh outreach department for a year or so and it's very valuable people need right now people need the answers that we hold and the things that we take for granted the general public out there and even people who profess to be Christians they don't know what we know oh it's an excellent time right now to get people saved or to get people baptized in the Holy Ghost if they are already are saved because there are so many people walking around. They even go to quote-unquote spirit-filled churches, and they, they have not been baptized in the Holy Ghost. And Christians were not designed to live in this world without the baptism. <laughs> it's just not, it wasn't normal. In the early church, everyone got baptized in the Holy Ghost and spoke with tongues. But nowadays, people are more ashamed of it. There's very little teaching on it. It sounds weird, and, and so it's not practiced much. And, uh, and so it's like a subject that doesn't come up. Well, I think it's part of the reason why we've got things so bad in this country is we've grieved the Holy Ghost as the church. Is, church has got to ne never be ashamed of Holy Ghost power because Holy Ghost power 
is the thing that can turn, thing, turn, turn things around. I hope you're getting something out of this tonight. <laughs> I just want to keep you encouraged. Let's not fall victim to the mully grubs. <laughs> Amen. So do the work of an evangelist. It just simply means have an emphasis on getting people saved, putting your arm around them, making sure they get into a good local church, stick with them until they get their feet on the ground. That's what happened to me when I got saved. The people that were responsible, they didn't just leave me. I mean, we went into a Bible study together, and they encouraged me to do this, that, and the other. They got me hooked up at, at Lakewood Church, and I mean, they really helped me out to get my, myself grounded in the Word so that I didn't spend uh, years in the doldrums. That's the, a lot of times people will say that sinner's prayer, and then no one's there to kind of help them. A, a connect the dots. Do you knew, know what I mean by connect the dots? You know, they used to have these little puzzles with dots on a page and they were numbered. And I was a kid, I loved to do that. You just connect one, two, three, four, and four, you know it, you've got a bunny rabbit that you've drew or you've got a, uh, you know, whatever, whatever figure. And then you color it. It's kind of a, kind of a coloring book. Well, you connect the dots. You need, they need someone to connect the dots with them. They need somebody to fill out the picture so that they can make good spiritual decisions about which church they go to. They don't wind up in some uh, cult or wind up in some church that doesn't believe the Bible or some church that's not spirit-filled. I tell you, we need the Word, but we need the Spirit, and we have that. So let's, let's keep that in the forefront of our thinking. Right now, people are, are in need, and let's fill that need. And then the last one there, again in verse 5, make full proof of your ministry. Make full proof. In other words, fulfill your ministry. Fully perform all the duties of your ministry. Do a thorough job. Do a thorough job. When I think about that verse, I just think about how many pastors are violating that a, a command that Paul gave Timothy. They're not making full proof of their ministry. They're kind of glad to not have to go down to the church as often as they used to. They think just having a live stream service is good enough. I've heard them say it. I've heard them say it out loud. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a lot better. I'm not working near as hard. I got a lot more time for my family. Well, whoop de doo I believe in having time for your family. I'm suspecting that you've got a lot more time for your golf game. Maybe you've got a lot more time to, you know, go to the picture show or something like that. I don't know. Listen, uh, let's make full proof. So on your side, see, on Timothy's side, what, what ministry? Well, he's an apostle. And, and Paul is challenging him, do the duties and make full proof. I think about people like Brother brother. Osteen, you know, I was around him for 15 years, traveled with him for eight years. And I, and I was thinking the other day, trying to remember, had, had I ever witnessed him take a, take a vacation? And the closest thing that he came to taking a vacation, he and Dodie were having an anniversary. And uh, the lady that did all of his uh, flight and all of his travel, she was a travel agent. Back then, people used travel agents. And she was a travel agent, and she uh, would always book him on Air France. And Air France started uh, uh, flying the Concorde uh, back and forth to Paris from New York. And so he had, she had arranged for him to get a real good ticket, because regular ticket on a Concorde back then was like, I want to say it's like $3,500 or $4,000, you know. And then that's one way. So <laughs> Round trip. <laughs> Round trip is a lot of money. <laughs> now, Brother Osteen was not like that. He did not spend money like that. But when she got this extra special deal, he wanted to take Dodie with him to India. And on the way, they'd stop in Paris. And it wasn't just all missions, but it was going to be a ple business pleasure trip. And she didn't want to go. <laughs> but that's the first, that's the first and only semi-vacation I ever saw him take. He was always working. He never took off. And so then he, I heard about that. And so, uh, uh, you know, my source told me, he says, I think he's going to ask you to go since Dodie's not going to go. So I got to go on this concord. 
and I actually got to fly in the Concorde. But uh, it was not a vacation, I can tell you that. <laughs> it was not a vacation. Uh, serious about it. I, I think about Brother Hagin, the last 10 years of his life, he spent traveling to his Rama churches, making sure they were on fire, making sure that they were, they were word churches and word and spirit, and making sure that the Spirit of God was in demonstration and, and correcting any things that he needed to see. And, and, and they knew when Brother Hagin has come, he's not just there to, you know, he's there to look and, 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 and make corrections when needed. This is his legacy, and he wanted to watch over it. And instead of being retired and sitting in his house and, you know, writing a book or something like that, he's out there traveling in, at 75, you know, years old, traveling all over the country. So he made full proof of his ministry. He fully performed all the duties of his ministry. He even wrote a book toward the, toward the last to correct some things. You know, Brother Hagin stood in the office of the prophet, and he had many visitations of Jesus. And, and, and the church had all kinds of excesses. It had all kinds of doctrinal uh, difficulties, as it always has. And you have to have a strong prophetic and apostolic ministry functioning so that those things get corrected. And uh, he was in the forefront of that, doing that. God placed him in that business. And so I'm so glad that he made full proof. Brother Osteen made full proof. I intend to make full proof. Well, let's all make full proof. You have a ministry. The believer's ministry is absolutely critical. You have to do the, the job you've been sent to do. What is that? To be a witness. Get on the witness stand and testify of what you have seen and heard. And be effective at it. And pray for people when they need prayer. When the Spirit of God puts somebody on your heart, pray for them. When he tells you to go and and see them, go see them. I mean, you know, the Holy Spirit, if you open your heart and begin to be uh, obedient at the slightest thing, I tell you, God will do that. I heard, had somebody tell me one time, you know, God used to be, use me that way. He used to use me in healing, and my hands used to burn. Well, listen, fast and pray and seek the Lord and ask him to put that back on you. Sometimes you just need a restart. <laughs> You just need a restart. I worked in a big old plant one time making aluminum, and uh, it was an electrolytic process. And from time to time, it happened maybe twice a year, they would have to shut the entire plant down, which was expensive, because when you shut the plant down, you're not making any aluminum there for a period of time. They would have to shut the entire plant down, let everything come down. They had to go and stabilize all these big electrolytic cells in which the aluminum was being made and cool them off. It was hot and, and, and molten aluminum in there. They had to cool everything down and, and adjust everything, and then they'd start the plant back up. And uh, some, some of you just need a restart. Have you ever had your computer kind of giving you trouble sometimes? If it freezes or gives you trouble, what do you do? You turn it off and restart the computer. Maybe you need to restart your connection with God and fast and pray for a couple of days and say, God, I want to be using these last days. I, I want to get back to where I used to be with, with my hands burning and laying hands on sick people. Or maybe that's never happened. Maybe your hands have never burned. Well, I, I'm just using it as an example. Uh, your, whatever spiritual gifts you have, if they've waned, it doesn't mean God took them away. It just means that they kind of shriveled for disuse. Let your, uh, you know, let your uh, in enthusiasm and your obedience shine toward the Lord and ask him to send it back, that you'll be faithful to operate in it. And so regardless of that, these seven things will keep you safe no matter what starts to happen in this world. We, we you know, I was reading a quote the other day, nobody held George Washington by the hand and told him everything was going to be all right. I mean, it looked pretty bleak when he, when he marched across the Delaware, you know. And, well, he didn't march across. He went about across on boats. But, I mean, a lot of his soldiers didn't even have shoes, and, and they didn't have all the, the best weaponry and everything, but they defeated the greatest army that existed in that day. God was the difference maker because they were on God's side. And so if we'll get on God's side, God's power will be available and tangible to not only help us to win the battles that we have, but also to protect us. And, uh, and I tell you, I believe we're living in, in great days, and I do believe that our greatest days are yet ahead.